December, everybody. Many of you YouTubers out there are probably already planning for the inevitable, but however you celebrate it, December tends to bring out a nostalgic side in all of us. Take me, for example. Every Christmas, I recall fond memories of sitting by the fireplace, hiding under the Christmas tree, decorating gingerbread people, hardly sleeping because I'm anticipating Santa's arrival, opening my stocking the next morning to find that precious Disney tape. Disney, 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 Disney! What is more nostalgic than Disney? With its standard branding of optimism, imagination, and dream fulfillment, nearly every single human being alive today in the Western world has encountered Disney in their lifetime. And why wouldn't they? It's a company founded in the early 20th century and has decades of experience under its belt, enabling continual improvement of future storytelling. In fact, it's a company that will soon be turning 100. And considering how we only celebrated the centennial of film itself a mere two decades ago, that makes Disney almost as old as the medium which made it famous. While I can't declare myself the authority of historical analysis for the company or anything, there is one thing I know for certain. Studying the ins and outs of this massively influential studio fascinates me to bits. Indeed, nostalgia has a lot to do with it. However, I am also a film student with a deep love for animation and music, both of which are integral to Disney. But perhaps most of all, it's my fascination with culture fashions, trends, and art forms which leave their stamps on society, even if only for a short period of time. These fleeting moments in our society shape us, and we in turn shape them, creating a continuous give-and-take relationship between audience, art, and history. And at the heart of it all has been Disney. Disney has always been a product of its time, but very few have actually studied the studio in this particular context, at least publicly online. Adaptation, ideology, and certainly the demographic have always been hot topics for critique, but the ongoing temporal relationship between Disney and American culture? Not so much. Why not? Why not go back and view the company from both the mind of the past and the mind of the present? Well, I have heard the summon call, fellow viewers. Come with me, and we will travel back in time to where it all began. Way back. Wait, what? Did I do that? No, even further than that. To... to observe Disney's animated canon and its extensions from the dates of their release. But... but before we do that, we... we have to go even further back. To... to the time when this all began. To... to the advent of film. Okay, what the hell? I'm not a magician! I can control the post-production, but I never planned for a bloody wardrobe upgrade. Well, I'll figure this out later. Anyway, allow me to let you in on a little secret. All film is animation. Before the medium was even created, it was discovered that if you combine a series of similarly composited images together, it can create the illusion of movement. At the time, its potential wasn't realized, but... Stuff like this pinhole camera, introducing the world to photography, completely shifting the world of art forever, and all because of a little tiny light shining onto a piece of paper. Soon the act of photographing scenery and family portraits became customary, and soon the technology was being employed for other means. It was the Lumiere's who said, LET THERE BE LIGHT, by popularizing the idea of projective motion pictures so people could see them externally. And people were amazed! Audiences leaped out of their seats and marveled over the background leaves wrestling on their own, the exposed intimacy, and- OH MY GOD THE TRAIN IS COMING STRAIGHT TOWARD US! Oh wait, it's just on the screen. But it was reality captured, at least as close to reality as a machine could be at the time. Three minutes of everyday spectacle changed to ten minutes of narrative, and so more elaborate sets and story elements come into play, slowly making film and art form all of its own. And now it should be clearer than ever before why they call them motion pictures. It was only six years after film was introduced that a child by the name Walter Elias Disney was born. Little Disney was moved around from place to place with his family, and worked hard to keep the household thriving. At one of their hometowns, he became best friends with the Pfeiffer family, and through them he was introduced to the world of theater, vaudeville, and, more importantly, the movies. He discovered his ability to draw at an even younger age, and was even hired by his neighbor to draw his pet horse. Oh, the jobs you could get in those days. Anyway, this expanded into a newspaper cartoon in high school, and then, when World War I started, he quit school to try and join the army. He failed. But he got to be an ambulance driver instead. Afterwards, he returned to the States and moved to Kansas City to find work outside the family business. When unable to land one, his older brother Roy lent him a hand by offering him a job at an art studio via a bank colleague, and this is where he met Up Iwerks. 
When their contracts expired, they aspired to form their own company together, which didn't turn out so well either due to Disney having to gain more money from outside source, which eventually led to both him and Iwerks dropping the idea to form an ad company. Hey! Ahem. <clears throat> However, this was not without its merits, for this was their introduction to animation, both in the technical and classical sense. The two of them did cut out animation, and Disney was permitted to take a camera home to experiment on his own time, which, along with his own literary studies, led him to believe that the future was cell animation. He left the company with co-worker and fellow animator Frank Harmon to once again form his own studio, this time with a focus on animation. Oh, and iWorks joined too. Eventually. With the help of local showman Frank Newman, Disney and Harmon created and screened the Laughograms. They look pretty primitive in hindsight, and their main characters are almost exactly the same in appearance, but for the time it was a pretty damn good start. The majority of them were also fairy tale adaptations. Sound familiar? It kicked off okay, but Disney wasn't very good at managing money, so they quickly ran out of resources. Again. Luckily for them, a dentist paid them $500 in exchange for creating an educational short about dental health, which afforded them the chance to make a new film called Alice's Wonderland. This proved successful, and in order to find themselves a distributor for the anticipated follow-up, they moved to the new hotspot for film, Los Angeles. With the fresh locale rejuvenating them, and the decline in popularity of their previous series, Disney and Iris together decided to create a new character for the masses, this cute little rabbit named Oswald. And he became a hit and received over 20 cartoons! Under his success, however, Universal producer Charles Mintz planned to decrease Disney's compensation rather than increase fees. And when met with an ultimatum, Disney left Universal, thus losing the rights to poor little Oswald. Due to the conflicted results of that last episode, Disney and iWorks, lone partners once again, pursued animation on their own once more under their still newborn Disney Brothers studio. They worked on creating yet another cartoon character based off a pet mouse Disney had owned at their Laughogram studio. iWorks designed and refined the body, which sure took after Oswald, I must say, while Disney provided the personality. At first, this guy was to be named Mortimer Mouse, but Disney's wife, anchor and cell painter Lillian Disney, wisely suggested a more peppy name, and so was born one of the most iconic characters in existence. Now, it may surprise some of you that the Almighty Mouse was not popular right off the bat. No, it was not because of his rowdy, then still immature personality traits. Though, some of those habits were incredibly questionable, and I wonder how many got past all that crap. Mickey, remember when we first met? Aw, oh, how could I forget? The moment I laid eyes on you, I knew I just had to craft a plane that would make you proud. Yes, and then you tried to kiss me. Well, uh, you were so beautiful I couldn't resist. And when I refused, you tried to terrify me. I, I was only trying to prove my... And then you were forceful. But why? It... I was young. Mickey, just admit it. You were a complete jerk. Yes, yes I was. The truth of the matter is that audiences enjoy Mickey. It's just that the distributors didn't care, and without them, the series couldn't be made. Mickey alone could not sell the show at the time. Film needed some more advancement for him to really get off the ground. During this time, film was not only black and white, but completely silent. Any musical accompaniment was live in the theater, and any dialogue was provided either through exaggerated gestures or intertitles. Or, in the case of cartoons, Nothing but blue skies from now on. You like that, Mama? Yeah. I'm glad of it. We have sound. Was history. Well, that doesn't quite mean we're done yet. Obviously. But I'll try to make the rest of this quick. Flapper dress, really? They set about making more shorts to take advantage of the synchronization, both Mickey focused and otherwise. Soon they created the first film with full Technicolor. Thank you. And with the help of his brother Roy keeping watch over the money situation, everything seemed to finally be going smoothly for Mr. Disney. Mickey was a success, he was winning Oscars for his shorts and innovations, and the mouse had been followed by a moody canine, a clumsy oaf, and a bird with more than a few anger issues, all of which were also growing in popularity. Disney at this point, or I'm sorry, he always insisted on Walt, had now become a household name and was adored by his colleagues. 
Hollywood star Lillian Gish called him the newest thing to happen to motion pictures. He even got praise from Charlie Chaplin. Point is, he already seemed to be in a high place. Where could he possibly go next? Well, his plan clearly was to keep going higher. Technology marched on and so did his dreams. And his dreams could only grow longer. You all know where this is going. Now it's time to get into the real meat of this idea. Tune in, or log in, next week, and together we will explore the Disney Company's first ever feature film, released in 1937. Join me then, and let's go back in time into the... So, how is this costume change thing going to work anyway? Are my normal clothes just going to come back as soon as the video is done? Well, it's over. I'll just cut right here and no one will know the difference. Any time now.